I think by this point in time, you've been in class long enough. If you've gotten to this presentation, I think that's a very fair question. I think you have to realize that anything in life that's worth having is worth working for. And I think that you will also find as you grow and as you mature that oftentimes some of the items that you had to work the hardest to obtain will be some of the items that you will value the most. Now, I know that I'm an old guy that doesn't know anything, but just think about that, file that away, and one of these days you may find that uh, some of Mr. Dayisms um, actually turned out to be true. All right, here we go. Right now, Sig Figs 2. Okay, so earlier you looked at the first three rules of Sig Figs. When you looked at the first three rules of Sig Figs, here's what you found. You found the definition of Sig Figs, which was, in part, how to properly write the numerical answer from a calculation. You know that sig figs are dependent upon, in part, upon the tool that you're using. So, once again, if I use an old school triple beam balance, it's called a triple beam balance because it has three beams. Well, what do I see when I look at the triple beam balance? I see a beam that measures in tens, I see a beam that measures in hundreds, and I see a beam that can go all the way down to a tenth. Okay. Therefore, it's possible for me to have a measurement like 135.5. If I had a measurement of 135.5, 135.5, it would have four significant figures. Okay? All right, continuing. Significant means worthy of mention or to be included. So a sig fig is a number, figure, significant figure, is a number that is, we can, would consider worthy of being recognized. And, you know, it's not something that we're just going to pick arbitrarily. You know, in other words, we're not just going to like, oh, we're going to pick this number. Um, we're going to pick it because of the measuring tool that we're using. So most of the time, for us, our sig figs are going to be determined by the accuracy, how precise. Because obviously, if I could measure the mass of something, if I could measure to the hundredth place, well, that's more accurate than measuring to a tenth. What if I could measure to a thousandth? Or what if I could get all the way to ten thousandth? You know, what if I had something, you know, the, 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 I would be more precise. Let's just face it, I would be more precise. So a lot of our significant figures will be tied to the precision of the tool that we're using. And if you remember, you go all the way back to the first presentation of the year, and how do you tie things together? How do, how do these threads on the spider web go together? Well, you also remember that we had a really nice discussion on precision versus accuracy, okay? They're not the same thing, but what we would like is we, in chemistry, we'd like to be both precise, which means to get the same thing again and again and again, uh, but we also want to be accurate. We want to get the right answer, okay? All right, so this is the second presentation on sig figs. And in the first presentation, we covered three rules. Well, what were they? Well, I hope by this point in time, you could, you could give me the three rules pretty easily. Um, the first rule was, you know, you had all uh, non-zero digits. So 24.7 has three sig figs. Easy peasy. What was the second rule? Well, the second rule concerned zeros that found themselves between non-zero digits. So 1,003 has four sig figs because the two zeros would be significant. They're between the one and the three. Okay, think about that again. 1,003, two zeros in between, they're all significant. What was the third rule? The third rule involved zeros that really, for the most part, were to the left, okay? either to the left of the decimal or to the left of the number, and what did they do? They served as placeholders, and therefore they were not considered significant. So 0 0.01 would only have one significant figure. Okay, that's the first three rules, pretty easy stuff. All right, now what about the next three rules? Well, that takes us to this presentation, rules four through six. All right, so rules four through six. All right, so we've already gone through the three for three of the first three, so let's go from four to six. So here we go. Rule number four. Zeros at the end of a number and to the right of a decimal point, okay, are always 
significant. Zeros at the end of a number and to the right of a decimal point are always significant. So the, the, the best way is really to, to, to have an example, okay? So, um, so, here we go. Classic example, all right? Now, if you'll think about my earlier comments about tools and the precision of tools, you know, really kind of think about this. If, if you could go, if you had a tool that you could go all the way out here, think about this. This tool would be a more precise tool than this tool, okay? And so these zeros, while this value, while there is no value there, in this particular case, they're still significant because they are really kind of signifying to you how precise that item really is. So even though it was whatever tool it was that you were using, and I, these are just made up numbers, but whatever tool it is that you're using, if it's even though it didn't, you know, it's just an even nine, these numbers would have to still be significant because they're showing the, the, the significance of the precision of the tool, okay? So kind of think about this, kind of try to tie everything together in your mind. Um, but this would have four sig figs, this would have four sig figs, and this would have four sig figs. They would all have four significant figures because these zeros would be considered significant because they're, they're significant to the measurement because they're helping to show how precise that measurement really is, okay? All right, so what's the answer? Well, once again, they would all have four sig figs. So go back. Zeros at the end of a number and to the right of a decimal point are always significant if they are numbers that are like this, okay? All right, so that's rule number four. Rule number five. Zeros at the rightmost end of a measurement that lie to the left of an understood decimal point are not significant. Now, I know, and you're going to, so here it is. This is where you got to think, and you got to buckle down. And I, I don't know what else to tell you other than to tell you that you're going to listen to Mr. Day talk to you honestly all year long. Okay? This is chemistry. So you're going to have to put some effort in, and you're going to have to wrap your mind around it. You can do it, but you got to want to do it. you got to have some fire in your belly. Okay, because if you think about this now, you can you might find yourself now. Wait a minute, those zeros. What's the difference? Well, okay, think about this again. The difference is, is that these zeros were helping to illustrate precision. Um, these zeros that we're about to look at now are all they're really doing is acting as placeholders, kind of like the zeros in the first three rules, remember? The zeros that were insignificant, okay, they were acting as placeholders. The zeros that we're about to look at will act, once again, as placeholders. So here we go. Zeros at the rightmost end of a measurement that lie to the left of an understood decimal point are not significant. If they serve as a placeholder to show the magnitude of the number, so this 300 only has one sig fig. This 7,000 only has one sig fig. This 27,210 only has, um, um, I'm sorry, this, I, that has one, that has one, this has one, two, three, four. Okay, now, so before you say, well, I don't see the difference between before, no, you should see the difference because this particular zero is holding a place it's helping to, it's, yes, it's helping to define the value. I certainly wouldn't argue about that. But it's not really illustrating the precision or the ability to measure out to a certain point. It's just simply acting as a, as a placeholder. Um, so these particular zeros would not be significant, okay? So in rule number five, it's kind of like rule number three from before, you know, um, I believe it was rule number three. Um, there are some times where numbers are not significant. There are a lot of times where they are significant, but in this particular case, these zeros would not be considered significant, okay? All right, so once again, one, one, and one, two, three, four, okay? Why? Because these zeros are not considered to be significant.
And you can always go back and read those definitions and kind of think about them. A lot of times you're going to have to read something more than once. You might have to watch something more than once to wrap your mind around it. You can do it, but you're going to have to do it, okay? All right, and then rule number six. There are two situations that give unlimited sig figs. Um, the first involves counting. Uh, the second is an exact defined quantity of measurement. So 23 people in your classroom. Okay, well, there's an example of, I mean, I know it has two sig figs. There's an example, you're counting something. You're counting a specified number of something. You can have unlimited sig figs for that. Um, 60 minutes in one hour. 60 minutes in one hour is an exact defined quantity. So, you know, whatever it takes to define an exact quantity, so there's really no, there's really no number of sig figs there. It's going to depend upon the quantity that is being quantified. Think about the word quantity. What, is, what, what does it mean to have a quantity? It means you're quantifying how many you have. Okay, so both of those have unlimited sig figs. Now here's where I'm gonna say something, okay? It's okay if you every once in a while feel overwhelmed. And here's, so here's another deism. It's okay if you're struggling. It's okay if something's not coming easy to you. It's okay if, if you know, there's some just, oh man, I don't know, I don't know, I gotta think about this, that's okay. Just slow down, take a deep breath. Sometimes it's good to tackle something in short, you know, tackle it, go do something else for a while and come back to it and think about it again. Sometimes it takes, you know, two or three times before you conquer it and that's okay. That's okay. That's part of being a learner, okay? And part of being a learner, a good learner is getting frustrated. Frustration is a part of learning. It's a part of it. You're not gonna get away from it, okay? All right, so you're good, you can handle this. All right, so take a deep breath, all right? You see life more clearly when you take a moment to breathe. All right, so take a deep breath and then kind of jump back in. Rules four through six, okay? Rule number one, every non-zero number is gonna be significant. Now, so we're going all the way back to rule one. That's easy, easy peasy. Every, every non-zero number is gonna be significant, so that's pretty simple. You know, what about rule two? If you have a zero in between non-zeros, well, that's pretty easy too. A zero in between non-zeros is significant. Rule number three, leftmost zeros, if they're acting as placeholders, they're not significant. So the first two rules were significant. These are not significant. Okay, so once again, you only have two sig figs there. Okay, now that gets us to today. Well, today, okay, uh, uh, well, I guess I threw in a note here, but today we wanna go from rules four through six, but let's take a look at my note. I forgot about this note. Let's take a look at the note. Okay, but to clarify, I realize that I still need to write the value accounting for the measurement. So that's where we use scientific notation. And that's, I wanted to throw in a note here when I was making this presentation because I like to tie things together just like the threads on a spider web. So sometimes you're gonna have these values that are cumbersome, like Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. I don't wanna write that number out. Um, I want a method or a methodology that makes that number less cumbersome, easier to use. But I still need to account for the number or I still need to account for the measurement. I may still have to consider significant figures, but if I can write it in a way that makes it easier to use by using scientific notation, a coefficient, okay, multiplied by a power of 10, then hey, sign me up. Um, it just makes our lives easier, okay? All right, rule number three, once again, leftmost zeros would not be considered significant. All right, now, here we go. Rules three and five, okay? They both involve zeros that are not, okay, considered significant. But they still find themselves in the measurement, okay? How? Well, 
scientific notation would be an example. Um, so if you had a number that was uh, uh, written in scientific notation, once again, it would be 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That's not, as I stand here and talk to you now, that's probably not the greatest example. This is, let's do this, and we'll do this on the fly, okay? All right, so probably a better example would be 0 0.0007, all right? Why would this be a better example? Well, because these numbers are insignificant, all right? They lie to the left. They're simply acting as placeholders. So how would we write this? Well, we know that if we're going to write this in scientific notation, we know that we would want a coefficient greater than or equal to 1, and we would multiply it by a power of 10. Well, so we would count. So we're, if we had a decimal point here, if that was a 7, we would go 1, 2, 3, 4 places to the left. So this would really be written as 7 times 10 to the negative 4th. 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, why do you care? Well, you care because the point that I'm trying to make here now is that even though we are saying that these zeros only act as placeholders, they still have to be there. They're still included. So if we are writing scientific notation, we're definitely still including these zeros. Um, we, uh, we're including them in the way that we write it, okay? So understand that even though we only consider this to have one, you know, sig fig, you know, obviously we still have to reflect these zeros because that tells us that we are in the 10,000th place, okay? And we'll talk about all this. Remember, presentations are presentations. We still do practice. We'll do other things. I'll have other tutorials, okay? But think about that because scientific notation is still reflecting those zeros, okay? All right. <clears throat> So what I want to do here, before I conclude, is I want to go back to rule number four, five, and six today, uh, because that's what this presentation was about, and I want to make sure that we put a little extra emphasis on rules four, five, and six, okay? So rule number four, if you're a zero at the end of a number, okay, and to the right of a decimal, then you are significant. Okay, so these are significant. All right, rule number five. If you're a zero that finds yourself at the rightmost end, okay, um, and you're only acting as a placeholder, then you are not significant. So these are not significant, okay, because they're simply acting as placeholders. All right, they're doing the same thing the other zeros were doing, they're just in a different place. All right, and then rule number six, there are a couple of instances where you can have unlimited sig figs. And those examples would be like if you were quantifying something, okay? All right, so slow down, think, watch presentations a couple of different times, watch the tutorials that I'll add, do the work in class, participate, look over your notes, and I promise you that if you do all of those things, you know, you will be successful. This is only one small piece of the puzzle, all right? Thank you. Have a good day.